Greetings and welcome to Church at Home. Church at Home is sponsored by the Christian Biblical Church of God, and we are dedicated to restoring original Christianity for today. In the first part, we looked at the spiritual connections between the life cycle of the monarch butterfly and a Christian's growth and character and the work that God is doing inside of a Christian. Now I want to look at the migration of the monarch butterfly because it is here that we find something even more amazing. We find a connection, believe it or not, with a Christian spiritual journey to the kingdom of God. Truly, this is an amazing story. Now, west of Mexico City is a mountain called Cerro Pallone. It rises about 10,000 feet above sea level. And each spring, when the weather begins to warm, the trees on the top of this mountain begin to stir with life, literally. This is because these trees are blanketed with tens of millions of monarch butterflies. And it was only recently that anyone knew where the monarch butterflies wintered over. Up until January 2nd, 1975, their place of hibernation was unknown. But it was on this day that a man by the name of Kenneth Brugger climbed to the top of this mountain and made the discovery. He was doing a search for a Dr. Fred Urquhart, who was a world-renowned monarch butterfly expert at the time. And his discovery actually led to many other locations in central Mexico where the monarchs reside during the winter. At the beginning of each spring, the monarch butterflies begin a trek that has been going on for thousands of years. And this journey begins as they fly toward the north and end up in the fields of Texas in the United States. It is here that they begin a frenzy of mating, laying of eggs, and within two weeks after they arrive and lay their eggs, the monarchs die off. But they have left behind the beginnings of the next generation. Now, the next generation, the second generation, when they hatch and they mature into full butterflies, they move quickly north. They do not hesitate. They do not stop. They fly north to the central United States. This is because the clock is ticking. From the time that their sexual organs are fully mature, they have about four weeks to live. Now, when they arrive in the central United States, they again repeat the cycle of mating and laying eggs and then dying off, leaving behind the beginnings of the third generation. The third generation then picks up the journey north and they arrive in areas around Minnesota, Wisconsin, southern Canada, the Great Lakes in the United States, where again, there are fields of milkweed plants and they repeat the cycle for the next generation before they die off as well. So this fourth generation, once they are fully mature, they fly northeast. Their primary destination is areas around New England, and southeast Canada. And it is here that they once again find fields of milkweed plants and go through the cycle for the next generation. And it is here that we pause because this fifth generation has a completely different mission from all preceding generations. In fact, they are of a different breed altogether. The first four generations of monarch butterflies only lived a total of about six weeks. That's from the time that they were laid as an egg until they died after mating. This fifth generation began a journey in the opposite direction. They are flying from northeastern United States, southeastern Canada, all the way back to Mexico. They will not stop. There is no generation after them. And they have one purpose in mind, and that is to reach central Mexico before the winter sets in. At this time, it is about the autumnal equinox. So temperatures are starting to drop, and they must get out of the northeast and down to Mexico before winter sets in. Otherwise, they will die. 
they have to get out of that area of the country and make it back down to the warm mountains in central Mexico. It is here that they will spend the entire winter hibernating. Recall that we talked about Kenneth Brugger, the man who discovered the winter hibernation of the monarch butterflies. Did you know he was colorblind? When he climbed to the top of the mountain and saw the vista of a hundred million monarch butterflies on the trees on Cerro Pallone, he could appreciate the color, the magnificent beauty that he saw before him. And there is some irony in this, because he also could not see the spiritual connection that we are going to talk about with God's people. Let's read in 2 Corinthians 4 and verse 4. In whom the God of this age has blinded the minds of those who do not believe, lest the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. Much of the world cannot understand this story that we are about to tell. And it is an amazing connection that we're going to talk about. One of the greatest puzzles that scientists have is how the monarch butterflies can make this incredible journey of 4,000 miles. Not only that, how do the first four generations know which direction to go, and how does the fifth generation know that it needs to turn around? In a large sense, this is very much like God's people. Since the time that the church was founded on Pentecost in 30 AD, God's people have been on a journey to the kingdom of God. But the preceding generations didn't know anything about the next generation, and the succeeding generations did not know the people coming before them. In a large sense, each generation is almost separated by time from preceding generations, but we are all on the same journey. We do not know how those that came before us knew which way to go. And how do we know which way to go? Let's turn over to John chapter 14, verse 4. And where I am you know, and the way you know. Thomas said to him, that's Jesus Christ, Lord, we do not know where you are going. How can we then know the way? Jesus said to him, I am the way and the truth and the life, and no one comes to the Father except through me. Every generation of God's people is on a journey to the kingdom of God. And we know the way because Jesus Christ is the way. He tells us how to get there. This is true with the monarch butterflies. Each generation is independent of the previous one, but they all know the way that they should go. Our journey is not over distance, but it is through the way of life to the kingdom of God. Now, each generation of Christian does not complete the whole journey, but they complete a part of it. Part of that journey is spreading the gospel and teaching the succeeding generation of the way to the kingdom of God. Now, as you might imagine, a journey of 2,000 miles is quite hazardous, especially for a fragile creature like the monarch butterfly. They can be blown off into the Atlantic with winds, Storms can drop them into the Great Lakes or into the sea where they die and drown. Many are hit by car windows, eaten by birds, other insects. It is a journey in which many perish. But God, for thousands of years, has always preserved the generations of the monarch butterflies. And God has promised that his church will never die. Matthew 16, verse 18 and I say also to you that you are Peter, but upon this rock, that is the rock of Jesus Christ, I will build my church, and the gates of the grave shall not prevail against it. No matter what the trials, God promises to preserve his church. Though some may die, the church will continue 
until the end when he returns. Even so, the preceding generations of the monarch butterflies were completely different from the last generation. The last generation had one purpose. It wasn't mating, it was the preservation of their lives. The first four generations of monarchs propagated the species with succeeding generations, but the last generation is undertaking a journey of 2,000 miles so that they may find safety during the winter. Likewise, the last generation of God's people will be unique. They will endure and live through the times of sorrow and into the tribulation where many will die, but God has promised to preserve them because they are on a special journey at the end of the age. It is a time when the world is being completely torn apart. Another unique thing about the last generation of monarchs is that they live seven to 12 times longer than the previous four generations. The first four generations only lived about four weeks, six weeks max. But this last generation will reach their destination around November and they will stay there until around March or April. So they live about six months instead of six weeks. Likewise, the last generation of God's people will live in times that are completely different. The previous generations, prior to the times of sorrow and the tribulation, have one purpose, spreading the gospel to the whole world, teaching their children, and raising up that next generation. But we are told that in the last times, there will be a famine of the hearing of God's word. So this last generation is not spending their time preaching the gospel. They are going to be the ones taken before kings to preach whatsoever God inspires them. They are the ones who will be suffering through the tribulation. They will be the ones making an example unto the people of this world for those that God has called to be in his kingdom. The story of the monarch butterfly has many incredible connections, but if you would like a deeper understanding of this amazing story, please visit our website and download or ask for a free copy of the book, Why Were You Born? At this point, I wanna talk about some other amazing facts, not just about monarchs, but other butterflies as well. Every true Christian recognizes there is one true God and one false God, that is Satan. His name means adversary. Interestingly, there is the monarch butterfly, the true monarch butterfly, and there is a false monarch. The false monarch is actually called the Viceroy, and it's not even of the same family as the monarch. It looks almost identical to the monarch butterfly. And I think that there is no question that these two butterflies are a part and counterpart to God and Satan. Let's read in 2 Corinthians 11 and verse 14. It is no marvel for Satan himself transforms himself into an angel of light. Now the butterfly goes through a process called metamorphosis. This word metamorphosis is a Greek word and it means to change fundamentally, to change from within. But the word used when talking about Satan transforming himself into an angel of light, that word is different and it means to disguise and to change the outward appearance. Is this not what Satan does? Amazing connection here, but it gets better. The only distinguishing characteristic between the monarch and the viceroy is a mark on the hind wings of the viceroy. It's a horizontal line parallel to the wings on the hind wings. It's a mark, a black mark. Obviously, we can go to Revelation chapter 13 and verse 16 and see the connection. And he, that is the beast power, causes all, the small and the great, and the rich and the poor, and the free and the bond, 
to receive a mark in their right hands or their foreheads. Now, another amazing coincidence, you might say, but I think inspired connection is that of the name of the Viceroy. The name Viceroy means one who rules in place of a king. He was given this earth to rule. We can see that in John 14 and verse 30. Another amazing fact about the monarchs is that they eat one thing as a butterfly. Caterpillars, they eat only the milkweed plant, but as a butterfly, they only feed on nectar. We saw last time that there is one spiritual food for Christians. Let's review it in Matthew 4 and verse 4. Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. But what about the viceroy? The viceroy, it too also eats nectar, but it also, as part of its diet, actually consumes dung and fungi. Dung and fungi. There is a spiritual connection here, too, that is amazing. Philippians 3 and verse 8. But then truly, I count all things to be loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things. Here it is. And count them as dung that I may gain Christ. I don't think these are coincidences. There is nothing in the life of the monarch butterfly that can have so many coincidences and not be there for a purpose. Now the name monarch comes from two Greek words, monos arcane. It means one ruler, a position of authority and power derived by hereditary right. Is this not also reflected in the promises of God to his people? We are to inherit all things, as it says in Revelation 21 and verse 7. All things. That is an amazing promise. Now, when the butterfly emerges from its chrysalis, as we discussed last time, it's called in the Latin imago. When a person receives the Holy Spirit, he also is a new creation, as we can see in 2 Corinthians 5 and verse 17. But when he becomes a spirit being, he is born of God and takes on a new image. Let's read it. 1 Corinthians 15 and verse 49. And as we have borne the image of the one made of dust, that is Adam, we shall also bear the image of the heavenly one. We will be the image of God. Now, a butterfly's mouth is like a drinking straw, but when it emerges from the chrysalis, its tongue is actually in two pieces. It's split along the length of it. It's not joined together. And after the butterfly emerges, it has two things that it has to do. One is to unfold its wings, but the other one is to form what's called the proboscis. These are taking the two halves of that tongue and forming them together. So when the butterfly emerges from the chrysalis, it actually has a forked tongue. And using two palpi on either side of its head, it massages those forked halves into a single tube from which it can drink nectar. If it fails to do this, it will die. But also, this is part of a Christian's character and growth. Think about it. Let's read in 1 Timothy 3 and verse 8. In the same way also, the deacons who serve must be serious-minded, not hypocritical. This word literally in the Greek is dilogos. Di meaning two, logos meaning word. It means double-tongued, telling a different story. So the forked tongue of the butterfly, when it first emerges from the chrysalis, is representative of the double tongue. In 1 Timothy 3 and verse 8, we're talking about deacons, but all of God's people must put aside that propensity to speak out of both sides of our mouths. And that's what God is doing. He is giving us character. 
He is keeping us on the path away from sin and unto righteousness. Again, another amazing spiritual thread just from the butterfly itself. Now, as we talked about last time, monarchs, as well as all butterflies, are cold-blooded. They cannot survive in temperatures down below freezing. And yet, it's amazing that the monarch's journey all the way to some of the coldest areas in North America, and with the risk of winter coming early, or storms and whatnot, they still survive. How does that happen? It's because of God. Monarchs right there. And they're really getting blown around. And this is the big danger for monarchs. With these severe storms that come through, they can get blown off the trees, they can get injured, and of course they can be killed uh, by the strong winds. I'm here at Point Pelee, the southernmost tip of mainland Canada. This is a stopping point for one of the most incredible migration journeys in the world, and that's for the monarch butterfly. Uh, you can actually see the wind is picked up in a big, big way, and uh, the monarchs are sort of trying to hang on as best they can. But just as God has taken care of the butterflies, God takes care of us. Let's read in Matthew 6 and verse 26. Observe the birds, or even the butterflies of heaven. They do not sow, neither do they reap, nor do they gather into granaries. And yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not much better than they? There's also the fact that many insects and butterflies are colored for camouflage. That is, they use the colors of their wings or their bodies to hide amongst their surroundings. But this is not true of the monarch butterfly. It actually is the opposite. It does not camouflage itself, but it has colors that are very bright and vibrant, and it stands out. This is called aposematism, and it is the opposite of camouflage. Likewise, God's people are not to be hidden. They're not to be hiding in places around the world never showing themselves, never speaking. Let's read what the Bible says about God's people. Matthew 5 and verse 16. In the same way also, you are to let your light shine before men so that they, so that all the world may see your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven. In fact, the wings of a butterfly are actually transparent. The reason that they don't look transparent is they're covered with iridescent scales. And these scales are a covering. They're like a cloak. And likewise, God clothes his people. Look in Revelation 19 and verse 8. It was granted to her, that is the church, that she be clothed in fine linen, pure and bright, for the fine linen is the righteousness of the saints. Butterflies also can see in the ultraviolet range. People can only see in the visible range. Ultraviolet is a higher frequency or a shorter wavelength band of light above the visible. But butterflies can see in this range and they see different colors and patterns reflected off the scales on their wings and so they can recognize one another uniquely. In other words, Monarchs can see other monarchs and their patterns. God's people, too, have a better vision of things. God has taken the veil of blindness that was upon us away and given us a vision and a sight that the rest of the world doesn't have. And we can recognize one another. We see differently. In Matthew 13 and verse 16, Blessed are your eyes because they see. Butterflies are also completely harmless. And God's people, too, are to be completely harmless. Matthew 10 and verse 16. Behold, I am sending you forth as sheep in the midst of wolves. Therefore, be wise as servants, but harmless as doves. What is the purpose and job of a butterfly? 
Butterflies flit from flower to flower drinking the nectar and in the process they pollinate the various plants. Did you know that the word pollen, it is a Latin word that means fine flower. In the Old Testament, every offering had to include fine flour with it. And fine flour represents man's labor, where they harvest the grain and they beat it and they grind it into fine flour and offer it with their sacrifices. Likewise, God's people are pollinating this world. Wherever we go, we should be leaving behind fine flour the sacrifice of our tongues, of our lips, God's word and his work in us. That is what we are leaving behind in this world. The connections so amazingly encapsulated by the life of the monarch butterfly, it is not a coincidence. This is a creation of God, just like the rainbow was put here as a reminder of God's promise never to flood the earth again. The simple, small, delicate, and beautiful monarch butterfly has a story to tell about God's people. We are near, if not in, the last days. How many of us will survive? I don't know. Will we be alive when Jesus Christ returns? Who knows? But we have one purpose. We must live God's way. In order to finish that journey, we must walk that way in all sincerity and truth. Just like the monarch has no choice but to migrate from Mexico to Canada and then return. We know that way and we must stick to it. Because in the end, we will be the children of God. And let's read our hope. In Philippians 3, beginning in verse 20, But for us, the commonwealth of God exists in the heavens, from where also we are waiting for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will change our vile bodies, that they may be conformed to his glorious body, according to the inner working of his own power, whereby he is able to subdue all things to himself. And in the monarch butterfly, we've seen a glimpse of what God is doing in his plan of salvation for mankind to bring his children into the kingdom. And if you want to know more about this incredible story, dig deeper into this mystery of the ages, please visit our website and download or ask for a free copy of our booklet, Why Were You Born? This is a story about you. This is a story about me. This is the most fantastic story ever told, and so few truly understand it. Get this book, because it will change, metamorphosize your life. Until next time, this is Stephen Green. Thank you for watching. And may God bless you.